This episode is brought to you by Cora Tampons, made from 100% certified organic cotton. Every Cora product is made with pure and ethically sourced ingredients. No pesticides, no fragrances, no bleach, no BPA, no synthetic materials. If you're still using conventional tampons, we need to talk. <laughs> you don't even know what you're putting inside of your vagina. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash Cora today and you'll receive your first month's supply free of charge. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 142. Welcome to the 142nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. In today's episode, I uh, am interviewing Dr. Pamela Frank. She's a naturopathic doctor who's local, so she lives in the Toronto area, so she's local to me. And she's been in practice for 20 years. So we get to talk uh, about some of her specializations, which is really exciting. I've had a number of emails come in recently from clients and just from listeners who I'm starting to get a lot of requests for just, you know, do you know any functional practitioners in my area? How do I find a really great practitioner? And so I actually preparing an episode for you for next week where I'm talking all about how to really just some tips of finding a really great practitioner in your area. Uh, Because I believe that wherever you live, there are practitioners who are amazing in their fields that you've probably never heard of because you just didn't know to look. So I'm really excited to talk more with you about that. Um, If you find that you are struggling with menstrual cycle irregularities or challenges, um, I also get a lot of emails from women struggling just to try to figure out what's happening with their cycles. And so that's the area that I specialize in because I specialize in being able to read those charts and connect what's happening in your charts with what's happening health-wise. So in a sense, I know what the right questions are to ask based on what I see in the charts. And so if you found yourself struggling in those areas, I would encourage you to head over to my work with me page and take a look at my program. So that's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. So if you are interested in the programs that I offer and you want to find out more information, I would invite you to set up a free 15 minute consultation with me. So you can do that right off of the site on the work with me page. These consults have been a great way for me to get to know members of my audience and also for me to structure my programs so that they're serving you and so that you're really getting the, the result that you're looking for. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. And before we jump into today's show, I'm just going to take a moment and thank our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Cora Tampons. Uh, So just the other day, I was having a conversation with my group program. So at the time of this recording, I'm just in the middle of my group programs. It's a lot of fun. I have two groups going. I have my birth control ladies and my conception ladies. And so as you can imagine, we have lots of really fun and engaging conversations in those groups. And one of the things that I realized is that just by bringing on Cora as a sponsor, it has kind of changed some of those dynamics. So uh, it's on everyone's radar, thinking about different ways to make sure that the menstrual cycle products that we're using are really healthy and clean. And so and that's one of the reasons that I was really happy to bring Cora on as a sponsor. Not only is it about the products, but it's also about the education piece, really bringing awareness to what we put in our bodies so that we really know and we can make those intentional decisions about what we're allowing to come into contact with our vaginas. Of course, I just love that Cora tampons are made with 100% organic cotton. So no synthetic materials and no pesticides or xenoestrogen chemicals, all that kind of stuff. But actually, a couple of weeks ago, I received my shipment of Cora tampons. So I received my very own shipment in the mail. And one of the things that occurred to me, so kind of beyond the really awesome natural health benefits of using something that's free of chemicals is the convenience factor. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. So I've never had uh, tampons delivered to my door before. That was the first time. (laughs) And I haven't really worked with very many women who just have like loads of time all the time. Most of us are pretty busy. We've got busy lives, demanding jobs, um, lots of responsibilities. And so not having to ever run out and buy tampons, uh, knowing that every couple of months, you're just going to get your shipment in the mail. I mean, having that convenience is incredible. So I would encourage you to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash Cora. When you sign up, you'll actually get your first month supply free of charge. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash Cora. Now let's jump into today's episode. 
And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Dr. Pamela Frank, to the show. It's always a treat when I get to interview someone who's local. And Dr. Frank has been a practicing naturopathic doctor since 1999. So that's a really long time. Uh, she has 20 years of experience as a medical laboratory technologist at Humber Re River Regional Hospital. She is clinical director of Forces of Nature Wellness Clinic in Toronto. And she was also voted twice the best naturopath in Toronto, which I'm actually really curious to hear more about because that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And so in today's episode, we're going to be talking about a few different topics, but more specifically fertility challenges and fertility, hormonal imbalances, acne, endometriosis. So we're going to be talking about a few different topics. So without further ado, uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Frank. So nice to have you. Thank you, Lisa. You were voted the best naturopath in Toronto. That's that's pretty cool, like really fun to put up on your wall, like I'm the best one. But maybe you could yeah. t share a little bit about how that came about and, um, you know, how you were nominated and how that worked out. Well, you know, it was it was really early in my career, actually. I think it was 2000 and 2001 were the two years. And uh, I think partly it was one of my patients who, he's phenomenal as far as following what I'd asked him to do, but he was just blown away with how well he responded to it. And he just, from then on, he just was a, went around and talked to everybody and told them everything and, and about how well it worked. And so he just, I think he really spouted my praise to a lot of people. And then, and then he got people also to vote for it. So, um, so anyway, that was uh, that Now magazine. City Centre Mirror, we were voted also a couple of times more recently for Best Naturopathy in Toronto. And we just this year actually won the Consumer's Choice Awards for Best Naturopathy in Toronto at Forces of Nature. So, Well, congratulations. That's really, well, really exciting. You. Well, I'm curious, when I was thinking when I was preparing for the interview, given your years of experience in the field, I wanted to ask you if you've seen any trends throughout that time or any shifts that are that would make what you do now different to what you did when you first started out. So when I first started, I would have been much more of a generalist or a GP as far as naturopathic medicine is concerned. I, I didn't have a specific focus in my practice. Uh, how it shifted to what I do now, which is much more to do with hormone balance and infertility, is that I, I had my own struggles. I had uh, my I had my son at 41 years old, but I, I struggled from PCOS, and uh, I had him entirely naturally with PCOS at 41. So I had advanced maternal age working against me, uh, and I had PCOS working against me. But uh, we did see a reproductive endocrinologist who went through and did all kinds of testing. There was nothing wrong as far as my partner was concerned. Um, for me, he did find some problems. But once he found those, identified them, uh, then I knew exactly what I needed to do as far as naturopathic treatment to try to reverse them. And within a few months of having had that diagnosis was when we conceived. So uh, anyway, that was partly what made me more passionate about, like, I think I really do think infertility can really benefit from naturopathic treatment. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing your story. I find it interesting from the interviewer perspective on the, the show that I often ask what drew you into the field or into the specialization that you find yourself in now. And I really do find that much of the time, there's a, you know, a really personal component, whether that's a, a personal health struggle, or even within your family or broader social circle. And it's it's also incredible that you were able to identify those things and really work towards rectifying those given all of the kind of at odds, right? The odds being against you at, at age 41. And so obviously it's not a really simple answer, but I think the listeners would want to know, especially the ones that are struggling with PCOS, what were the things that made the biggest difference for you at that time? Well, so I mean, I, I'd known I had PCOS from the time I was about, well, I, I was never officially diagnosed, but not until I was like later in my 30s. But uh, by the time I was 19, it became obvious that I had it. And it took a long time after that still to get a proper diagnosis, which I think is also a common frustration amongst women with PCOS. But anyways, what I did as far as dealing with that from the age of 19 or so onwards was uh, what a lot of uh, PCOS patients have to do, which is cut back some, some of the carbs and sugars out of their diet, uh, exercise regularly, try to keep stress under control. So those were the things that had kind of maintained me from the time I was 19 till I was at the age where I was trying to conceive. Uh, and, but then when I was trying to conceive, what kind of moved it forward from there was an herb called Vitex, which is not necessarily appropriate for everybody with PCOS, but it is an herb that helped to promote progesterone production for me. 
which is part of what helped us because I had to lower prolactin, which Vitex does, and I had to increase progesterone. That was really the main thing that the endocrinologist had found was that there was too much prolactin and too little progesterone. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the Vitex really made the shift for both of those things. Well, and from, I mean, from your perspective as a naturopathic doctor, you heard the diagnosis, the information, the test results, and immediately knew, you know, how to address that from a natural perspective. Right. Maybe you could share your perspective just generally on assisted reproductive technology, because in your case, had you not had the information that you did, then I think we both know that you very likely could have gone down a a completely different path. Well, and and that's exactly right, Lisa. Like, I'm sure had I not had the information I had, I'd have been said, okay, you're 41, you've got to do IVF right now. And and not knowing any better, I would have said, okay, well, these are these are experts in their field. They're telling me this, and I would I would have gone along and done that. But I, I really, from again, from my perspective now, from being on this side of the equation, I I feel like most people that end up going that route probably don't necessarily have to if they could get the right information about what they could do to reverse what's going on. But the majority of people that I see, because I deal with fertility a lot, and I see we always request the records from the fertility clinics that people have been at. Um, and I've poured through hundreds of people's fertility clinic reports. And almost all of them, I can't say, I can't think of one exception, where they haven't had a particular test done that would have given us the information that would have told us maybe why this person was struggling. A lot of times, it's very standardized testing where they're testing your estrogen levels, testing your progesterone levels, LHFSH, and doing a, a pregnancy test. And sometimes that's all that's being done. And there's not investigation into whether the person has PCOS. And there's not investigation into whether there's too much prolactin or whether there's not enough estrogen. Or So a lot of things that just aren't really being thoroughly investigated. And I think it's because it's very standardized as far as these are the tests that we do, then these are the procedures that we do. And and it doesn't really get tailored very much to the individual. Well, and you know, I would take that a step further and suggest that part of the reason those tests aren't being done is because, and I would be curious as to, on your perspective of this as well, but if they do all those tests, what are they going to do about it? Do they have the strategies in place to actually make changes based on that? I would well, wonder after- if you're if you're going for, for IVF procedure or if you're going to a, a clinic, then their solution is IVF. So then all those tests don't really change the outcome. Well, and, and that's probably a good point that that's probably why a lot of them aren't being done because because if if I'm a I'm an IVF person and I find that the person has too much testosterone, what am I going to do about it? They, there is it really isn't something that they would necessarily. I mean, in a non IVF setting, uh, drugs like spironolactone would be prescribed to try to bring the testosterone down. But that's only medicating the the issue. It's not really addressing the root of why it's there. And with high testosterone, a lot of times it is because there's too much, too many spikes in blood sugar, too much insulin circulating the majority of the time, and it's promoting too much testosterone production. So the solution then is to cut back on the foods that pro- provoke the spikes in the blood sugar and try to get the person exercising because those two things are, will bring down the insulin, that'll bring down the testosterone. Well, and I, I think that's so important. Uh even beyond the specifics of what's involved in bringing down testosterone, but the fact that you can affect these levels in non-invasive ways. And so throughout your years of, of, of work with women who are struggling with fertility challenges, PCOS, what have you, how do you balance that knowledge that you have at knowing that you can affect these levels and improve fertility naturally with that sense of urgency that women often come in with? And I feel it in in the work that I do, I work with women within the realm of fertility awareness charting. And so when you're charting your cycle, you can see things, right? You can see if things are off. It's like (laughs) right there in your face. It's super obvious. So, but then, you know, the approach that that you would take or the approach that I would take, it's not going to be instant. You know, we're not booking you an appointment to have your, you know, partner's semen be put into you tomorrow. It's usually something that takes a bit of time. So how do you balance that? 
one, and it's also a good question because having been, again, on both sides of the equation where I was the person trying to conceive, I know exactly what that feels like, especially when you're starting to get your late 30s, early 40s. The urgency definitely ramps up in every month where it's not happening and then you're frustrated and it's like you're upset and you're thinking it's not going to happen and your period comes. It's all just, it's very difficult to try to overcome that, especially when People are already, they've already been trying for a number of years, oftentimes by the time they come to see me. If they, but, but a lot of it is just, I try to tell people, don't think of it as like, we're going to waste the next three months of your you know, ability to, to get pregnant. Think of it as investing in the next three to six months of making your body better, which is going to make you a better mother. It's going to make you a better carrier for this baby. It's going to make a bit better baby, healthier baby in the long run. So think of it as an investment and, not, and that at the end of that six months, you're going to be in better shape than you are right now because right now it's not working. If you don't change anything, then it's still likely not going to be working. Um, I just had a lady the other day who she's been doing frozen embryo, embryo transfers and she's getting down to the last few of her embryos and her Husband's really pushing, pushing, pushing to to let's get on with this, and she's wanting to invest the time and and trying to make herself better. And I said, you know, if the previous three embryo transfers haven't worked, why would this one be any different? If you don't do something to change the environment that they're going into, and we began blood work that was never done at the fertility clinic, identified a hormone that was outside the normal range, and. I said, that's going to be an impediment to you being able to conceive with these embryos. So it would be better if you took the next three months, tried to get that level down, then do the embryo transfer because otherwise I don't, I see this as not, it's going to stop you from being able to get pregnant. Yeah, I I find that to be quite challenging because three months is an eternity and it's definitely that biological clock ticking concept and three months later, I'm going to be three months older, but technically... You know, if you actually put in, you know, the time and the work to really, and by work, I I probably mean sleep, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like if (laughs) if you're actually sleeping properly, relaxing, you know, so I use the term work loosely, but if you're really doing the work to improve yourself, arguably, you're probably going to end up younger from a biological standpoint, you know, if you really want to take it there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Chronological age and biological age are not the same thing. Um, and I often use my, my, I have a sibling who does not take good care of himself. And if you put the two of us side by side, you would think this person was 20 years older than I am. And that's because of the complete disparity between the two, the way the two of us take care of ourselves. I do, I'm the exact opposite. So his, I mean, his chronological age may say he's only two years older than me. His biological age would say that he's much older than me, just, and, and looking at him physically, you'd think that too. Well, and do you find in the work that you do, I mean, between you, the fertility doctor and your client, that you're the only one that really believes that your client and and your client's body has the capacity to do this? Uh, you know, I, I there. it's always with the medical profession, I find that you'll find a wide range of perspectives. So I, I'll find medical doctors and, and even doctors at IVF clinics who are extremely open-minded and extremely receptive to the idea of doing things that would help their patient to, you know, be more receptive and more fertile. Um, some of them even prescribe some of the vitamins and minerals and things that I would recommend to their patients even before they even come to see me. So, and, and I do think for them, a lot of times it is about the bottom line of, how many people they are able to get conceiving and having live pregnancy. So the um, sometimes they are quite open to anything that could be done to try to help the patient to be in a better place. Um, but I mean, sometimes they're, they're not so much. But of any kind of the medical profession that I've worked with, I often do find IVF clinic doctors are sometimes more receptive, only because of the fact that it, they, they perceive what I'm doing as something that's going to help to move their patient forward into the end goal, which is to have a live birth. Well, and even taking a step back from that, I find that when it comes to that conversation around going in and doing, uh, uh, of course, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the assisted reproductive technologies. That's not where I'm coming from, but more so uh, I do come from the perspective that if you support your body 
to be as healthy as it, it can be, then mm-hmm. it's much more likely that you'll be able to conceive without assisted reproductive technology. So often I find myself coming from the perspective that I actually do believe that it's possible that your body can do this. Whereas often the message from outside sources is more that, well, you know, your body can't do this. So we really need to do these interventions to force it to like to make it happen because right. your, your body's right. just not going to be able to do this on, on its own. Right, right. Well, and you know, the, the only time where IVF is absolutely essential is where there's two block tubes. And that's what it was invented for, was for women with two blocked fallopian tubes because the egg can't get to where the sperm is, is to get fertilized. Um, and IVF bypasses the need for that. But the rest of the time, I, I do think the majority of the people, if they can identify what is the root of the problem and, and get proper advice about what exactly to do about it, rather than just sort of reading what they can find on the internet, um, they can undo what the problem is and conceive properly on their own and, and be in a better place physically in order to have a healthy pregnancy. Well, let's talk a little bit about unexplained fertility. I would love for you to walk us through and give us an idea of what the process is like when a client comes to you. Because I think one of the problems, like you mentioned, with going on the internet and doing the whole Dr. Google thing is that you you really get the impression that I have this simple issue and all I need is to get this simple solution. So if you think, oh, I have high prolactin, well, I'm just going to Google lower high prolactin and then I'm going to take the thing that lowers it and then everything's going to be fine. Whereas mm-hmm. I'm, I know that the process that you do with your clients is not just going to just be like, oh, it's only high prolactin and like not look at any of the other areas that could be contributing to the problem. <laughs> Right, right. So, I mean, what we do as far as the process goes, the first visit is, is an hour and a half long. So we go through, you know, general medical history, like how is your energy and how is your sleep, but also like really detailed about hormonal, anything that might be to do with hormones. So what are your periods like? How heavy are they? How light are they? Or how long do they last? Are they, are there, is there clots? Is it bright red? Is it dark red? Is it purple? Is it, um, it, does it come every 28 to 30 days or is it sometimes coming every 26 days or every 24 days? Is it, or is it coming every 40 or 60 days? And these things are all important. They're all clues as to what exactly is going on and what's, what might be wrong. And then also just the physical things like acne and is your hair falling out and, or do you have excess hair somewhere, chin hairs, chest hairs, hairs on your belly? How painful are your periods and do you need to take medication for them or if you're having pain elsewhere in the cycle, where, where is it? Is it around ovulation? Is it the week before your period comes? So we go through all of that stuff in really great detail. But also, like I said, we almost always, if someone's at a fertility clinic, we request the records so that I can pour over it and just see what exactly was measured. Um, I also tend to apply rather than lab ranges because my previous occupation as a laboratory technologist taught me that lab ranges are just averages. They're, they're averages of the people that have been tested. The, tested. the people that have been tested for hormones particularly are not necessarily healthy people. They're people that the doctor thought had a problem with their hormones, sent them to the lab for testing. So the lab just averages all those people and says, this is a normal range. Then the range comes out quite broad because you're averaging in people that have a known problem, like a fertility problem. So the lab ranges are not... Uh, ideal ranges by any stretch of the imagination, and they're not actually normal ranges. They're just averages. So what I usually would do is apply what I know to be ideal to the person's blood work and say, okay, well, this this is definitely not falling into ideal, and this hasn't even been tested, and then compile a list of, like, this is a little bit off, and you still need to have these tests done. So I would either do order those tests for them myself or refer them back to the fertility clinic and have them ask the fertility clinic to do them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then kind of put all that together as, uh, okay, here's what's really going on with you as far as all of the ins and outs of hormones and your period and, and fertility. So, and then from there, put a plan together of, okay, we need to make these diet changes and we might need to do these vitamins, minerals, and we might need to do some herbs to try to correct that. And then acupuncture may also help with this. Mm -hmm. So then we do kind of put together that kind of plan. Well, and you know, the more that that I work with women in my audience in the fertility awareness realm, the more that I I feel that it's so beneficial to work with a practitioner who specializes in whatever area that you need support with. 
mm-hmm. to really get that specialized care. Now, I, I'm not sure that it's always 100% necessary to, to have someone highly specialized, but I do feel that it's always beneficial. Because if you're going to someone from more of a general perspective, many of those tests that you know to be very important, specifically for fertility and the detailed history that you're taking, even with respect to cycle length and, um, you know, bleeding quality, quantity, all of those things, those may not be even looked at if you're going to someone who doesn't specialize in that area. And it's so important to have that full, thorough workup just done. (laughs) Right, right. And then and you're right, that somebody that from the perspective that they know what to look for. Yeah, so important. And from, so one of the things that I, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about is, is endometriosis and the link between that and infertility. And as I was mentioning to you in the pre-chat, I recently did an interview with a surgeon. So he's trained in NAPRO technology. And so he's um, a sur- like a, one of the surgical... Um, he's gone through the surgical program. And so I was really excited to speak to him because in terms of surgery, as far as surgery goes, that particular paradigm of surgery is, you know, at, at least the least invasive, um, really minimizing adhesions and really paying attention to preserving the the tissues in the woman. But I think I, I did feel like it would be interesting to to think about that from different perspectives. So from a surgical perspective, you know, you're looking to cut out the the diseased tissue and often that can have a really significant positive impact on, you know, the level of pain and all of those different types of things. But from your perspective, how are you able to support women who have uh, endometriosis or who you suspect might have endometriosis? The handout that I give everybody for endometriosis, and it just at the top of the handout, this goes through any of the theories that I've been able to come across over the years as to why women have endometriosis. Because to me, if you don't understand why the person has a particular problem, whether it's infertility or PCOS or endometriosis or whatever, you can't possibly address the root of the problem if you don't understand why. So there are a number of theories with endometriosis as to why women have it. The prevailing one used to be that it was just backward menstrual flow was ending up in the abdomen and that was causing it. But uh, that theory seems to have been discounted a little bit only because something like 90% of all women have that. So why don't 90% of all women have endometriosis? So the I think the reason why is, is not that that may be not the right theory. There's a few other theories, newer ones. One that says that it's not that it's uterine lining tissue that has got out, but at, rather it's abdominal cells that have turned themselves into uterine lining cells. And if that's the theory, then you have to ask, why is that doing? Why is that happening? And then I I think sometimes it's because there's just this abundance of estrogen in that person's body. So a lot of the medical treatments for endometriosis are not so much about bringing estrogen down, but about um, bringing progesterone up so that it's more in balance with estrogen. So I can do similar things to try to bring progesterone up using herbs, but um, I would rather, if the problem is actually that there's too much estrogen, rather than bringing progesterone up to match it, bring the estrogen down. So the surgery, while it will remove, it'll remove the adhesions, it will remove some old tissue, it's not addressing any of those things. Um, And therefore, within a year to a year and a half after surgery, endometriosis usually recurs. So it's by no means any kind of permanent solution. So I'm not against people going for surgery, and it does often provide them fairly um, great improvement as far as the symptoms. But um, if you're not really addressing the underlying root of the problem, you're just bound to be back in in the surgeon's office again in a year and a half. So uh, I'd rather, if people are doing surgery, that they're also at the same time addressing the root cause of the problem. Um, That I have had where I found, like, sometimes people don't need to go for surgery at all. I can find that through some of the naturopathic treatments, we can get the pain under control, we can remove the root of the problem, and, and it seems to entirely subside the endometriosis. Um, in other cases where it doesn't, uh, it seems to be where there's, I think, significant adhesion, um, and that's where the surgery really does help to relieve the pain. Meanwhile, we're still working away at the root of why the endometriosis is there. Mm-hmm. Well, you said something earlier about the environment and with regards to the frozen embryo transplant with the patient that you were working with, 
And right. what you're saying with endometriosis is it basically exactly the same thing, which is that the environment within your body created the set the stage essentially for the endometriosis to be there. And so if you're not addressing that actual environment, then w- how, what's to say that the environment isn't still there and the endometriosis can't come back? Well, yeah. And like I said, it does typically. The, the research suggests that within a year, two and a half after surgery, it does. Um, I think then they would tend to use medication, like I said, to something like Vizam, which is to help to bring progesterone up. But it, it may not be that progesterone needs to be brought up. It's more about helping the body to deal with es- estrogen or dioxin, which has also been linked to endometriosis, which is an environmental pollutant. And if the liver is not clearing that out efficiently, then it can also lead to endometriosis. So perhaps through helping the liver with dealing with either estrogen metabolism or also dioxin metabolism. Mm-hmm. And then overall, the person's in better shape no matter what, because their liver is working more efficiently, removing toxins and chemicals and pollution and, and body waste better than it was before. Well, yeah, so important. And what was really interesting about the interview, so for those listening, it was the interview with Dr. Bider. So I'll have that linked in the show notes page. There's a couple of things interesting. So because he's a surgeon, he's actually seen endometriosis with his own eyes. So at one point, I asked him to describe what it looked like. And he actually, on because we were on Skype, he actually pulled up his uh, an image and, and showed me. So he had a presentation which he shared with me. So that's going to be also available um, on the show notes page for that episode. But it was really interesting to see it. So now as you talk about endometriosis, I actually have this picture in my mind and what it looked like in the the PowerPoint presentation, which are actual pictures from surgeries that he's done is that the healthy tissue is, you know, looks pink or, you know, reddish. Mm -hmm. And then the endometriosis tissue looked black and Mm. or blistered. Mm -hmm. And so you could very clearly see with your own eyes that kind of what he called kind of diseased tissue, right? But you could actually see it. It's so interesting to have that just now in my mind when we talk about endometriosis. And he really described what it adhesions were. So for I am not a surgeon and, you know, I'm not a naturopath. And so he described that it's quite literally tissue sticking together that shouldn't be. And uh, so, you know, it just makes me think of so many different connections in my interview. I did an interview very early on in the podcast. It's episode number 18 with Dr. Rosita Arvigo. And she described the Arvigo therapy, which is the, you know, the physical manipulation, the physical not exactly massage, more of a therapeutic type of movement of the uterus and the fallopian tubes and everything. And so I feel that with all of those things added together, I have this um, more of a complete picture of why that can also improve circulation and improve pain and all those types of things to kind of gently Mm -hmm. nudge those tissues to where they should be. Right. Well, and the alternative to... um surgery for pelvic adhesion is to do pelvic physiotherapy, which, you know, there are people who specialize, physiotherapists who specialize in pelvic physiotherapy, trying to help to unstick those adhesions and help, because everything's supposed to move fairly freely in there. And if it's all stuck together, then that's why it's particularly painful when things are trying to move around. Well, and so, you know, from your perspective and your experience, is there a link then? I mean, I, I think there it's, it is well established in, in the literature, but how have you seen that link between endometriosis and infertility play out? And have you seen that change and improve then with non-invasive uh, methods in your patients? Yeah. So the other thing with endometriosis, the other thing with endometriosis is that they're finding that there's another theory, a newer one as well, about telomerase, which is an enzyme that's in the lining of the uterus. Everybody's got it. Uh, it in women with endometriosis, it's overly active. It's active through their entire cycle, where it's only supposed to be active through the first half of the cycle. So the other thing with endometriosis is, if it is something to do with this telomerase enzyme, it's affecting the quality of the lining and how receptive it may be to a fertilized embryo, then there's things we can do to also affect that. Normally... Um, there's something you produce every night for sleeping, which is melatonin. People are sometimes familiar with because they travel and they need it to help them get to sleep. But melatonin helps to decrease that enzyme. So that's one of the natural ways that I can help with endometriosis if it is that the uterine line is just not receptive and that's because of the telomerase enzyme. Um, but then the other things I can do too. So if there is something to do with the tubes, if they're, if they're fully blocked, I do find that sometimes that's where IVF is necessary and or where there's other things that need to be happening to help unblock the tubes. 
But uh, as far as naturopathic treatment, um, acupuncture sometimes helps if it's just more of a functional problem with the tubes where it's just not working properly to propel the fertilized embryo into the uterus. Uh, and or with relieving pain. I find acupuncture is really good for helping re- relieve pain with endometriosis. Well, and you mentioned that there are you know, other options for unblocking the tubes. Would you mind going into that a little bit? I'm sure the listeners are wondering, is it possible? Well, to- and again, it, it would be surgical options, not mainly. I, I've had patients over the years who came to me asking me to unblock their tubes. And, and I, don't, I don't think as a naturopath, I don't think there's ways that I can help them to unblock. The only thing I have found is sometimes there has been misdiagnosis of blocked tubes, uh, where they either it's not actually been blocked or there's been something else. There's been spasm in the tube at the time that the ultrasound was done and it looked like the tube was blocked. So uh, there's been misdiagnosis of blocked tubes. And in that case, that's where I've been able to help. But where they are actually fully blocked with endometriosis tissue, um, I think surgery and or IVF are really the only options there. Mm-hmm. Well, and one of the the challenges with endometriosis is is diagnosis, and so right. often to get an accurate actual diagnosis, um, if it can't be done via ultrasound, it, it needs to be done via a, a less invasive type of surgery. So, do you find do you do you feel that endometriosis is something that's underdiagnosed, or do you have patients who are not diagnosed? What do you do if a patient has, say, a lot of pelvic pain and different symptoms, but they have not yet been diagnosed? Well, a lot of times you're right that they have been diagnosed. And sometimes people that are diagnosed as unexplained infertility is actually because of endometriosis. I saw a study once that said, you know, any patient who is diagnosed with unexplained infertility should have laparoscopic surgery done to rule out endometriosis. So, but that's not done, generally speaking, I would say. I'm not sure if I've ever seen that happen. Mm-hmm. Often there's so much into the process of, of fertility and IVF and that that, that there, there's no need to do laparoscopic surgery because they're just doing IVF anyway. But um, anyway, the, a lot of times I do think that there is undiagnosed endometriosis. And same with polycystic ovarian syndrome. A lot of times it goes undiagnosed as well. The fertility claims, like I said, they're not even measuring uh, a fair bit of the time. They're not measuring the hormones to test for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So um, people end up with this unexplained infertility diagnosis. Well, you know, what's really interesting to me, so I'm sure you can appreciate. So from my perspective, when I see a woman and we get into the charting aspect and we kind of, you know, sort all of that out. And so now we're, you know, we're working together, looking at her charts. PCOS isn't, I'm sure there are situations where it may not be glaringly obvious, but, you know, it's kind of glaringly obvious. (laughs) <laughs> and by kind of, I mean, extremely glaringly obvious. So yeah. uh, how do you, maybe this is more of like a not scientific question, but how do you feel about that? Because I feel like with PCOS, although there's nuances to the diagnostic process, there are some pretty like serious red flag signs going on there. Yeah. Well, and there, so there's nuances to the diagnostic process, but also nuances to the condition. And people just always assume that, oh, PCOS, then there, there will be cysts on the ovaries and the person will be heavy or fat and they will be, you know, they may have really bad acne. And so there's a lot of assumptions made about this is what a PCOS person looks like. And if you don't look like that, then you can't have PCOS. And I've had people blatantly be told that where they clearly had PCOS and they had the criteria, they met the criteria for diagnosis for PCOS. So it is a bit frustrating, especially when, and as you said, because with the charting, Really, the common denominator with PCOS is that there is irregular ovulation, and and that's obviously going to be glaringly obvious in the person's charts. But the um, the the medical diagnosis, they're often expecting there to be high testosterone, or they're expecting there to be cysts on the ovaries, and there isn't always. PCOS is just sort of a it's a bit of a catch-all diagnosis, kind of like IBS is a catch-all diagnosis, where you just have this collection of symptoms. But the common denominator with all of those people is that they've got irregular ovulation and then you have to then you have to do the detective work to find out why is there irregular ovulation is it because of too much testosterone or too much prolactin or too little estrogen or underactive thyroid or you know a, a list of other things that it could potentially be that's affecting ovulation Mm-hmm. I really appreciate you sharing that because now I feel like it makes a lot more sense to me how someone could possibly miss it because 
from my perspective, I'm literally thinking to myself, how could you miss this? It's so obvious. Because if I see a woman that has four periods a year, and you see that she goes 70, 80 days between ovulations, well, um, hello. Yeah, exactly. exactly. (laughs) Can somebody please do a blood test? Like, what's going on here? (laughs) Yeah, but she's skinny. And then so the doctor just said, okay, well, she can't have PCOS. She's skinny. Yeah, but no, that really of, helps to, to help me understand of women with how. P- yeah, forty percent of women with PCOS are thin, uh, and and even those thin women, which uh, doctors assume, well, if they're thin, then they can't have insulin problems. Forty percent of those women who are thin and have PCOS have insulin resistance. So you can't judge a book by its cover, not especially not with PCOS. Yeah, so important. And for the listeners who are hearing this and perhaps new to the podcast, I've done a number of episodes specifically about PCOS where we've really gone into some of the particulars and they're really excellent. I'm not just like pulling my own horn here. There, there's quite a bit of really important information. So I will link all of the PCOS episodes to this one in case you're wanting to go and, and listen to those ones in particular. Uh, you know, but... One of the things that I want to ask you about specifically with respect to PCOS then is what, how do you go about supporting uh, a woman to, uh, with PCOS? I think just as an aside, especially because of the podcast, and I'm sure that you see this in your practice as well, women who are coming off of hormonal contraceptives, many of whom have been on them for quite a long time. The more I go into the research, there's a lot of research that's done about hormonal contraceptives and whether or not they're causing problems. And what I find the most interesting is so if you have PCOS and you don't know, and let's say it started when you were a late in your late teens, early 20s, or so, I don't know exactly when it would have started, but let's say that you had potential symptoms from way back then. And then you're on the pill for a really long time. What's interesting in the research is that they'll, they'll cite the averages. So when a woman comes off of hormonal contraceptives, what the research shows is that maj- the majority of women then will have a re- their periods will resume, let's say, within three to nine months. But for the women whose periods don't resume <laughs> within that mm-hmm. period of time, yeah. the research very quickly jumps in to say, well, then they must have had a pre-existing condition. It wasn't the pill. Mm-hmm. Um, so just from that standpoint, um, I'd be curious to know what your experience has been. Are you seeing women who've been on hormonal contraceptives for quite some time and come off and just their periods are MIA or it, is it presenting differently in your practice? I do see that where they come off the pill and, and I often say to people, it's like you shut a factory down for, you know, 20 years and then you come in and just turn all the lights on and the power and you expect everything's just going to rev right back up again. It, it doesn't necessarily, but I, I do think we're, I don't tend to blame the pill. I do tend to think it's not that the pill caused them to lose their period. It's more that it masked an underlying condition that was going on that you weren't aware was going on. Um, and oftentimes women are put on the pill in their, in their late teens, early twenties. And, you know, maybe at that time periods were regular, but maybe, you know, sometimes it is PCOS is something that kind of develops over time where they start, you know, to get a little more irregular as when they're getting into their mid to late twenties or, uh, and then they wouldn't be aware of it because of the fact the pill was giving them a regular period every month. Uh, I have seen women who found that their periods changed while they were on the pill. And then that, that's where I think, you know, okay, there's some kind of hormonal condition that's going on underneath the pill that you're still getting a period because the period's giving, or the pill's giving you that. But um, you're, there is something that's changing. Um, and so it does some, it is something that can kind of creep up on someone over time where they're not immediately aware of it when their periods first start, but over time into their late, teens, early to late 20s, things start to change as far as hormones are concerned. Well, I'm really, you know, I think it's really important what you said about the kind of that underlying disease process being masked by hormonal contraceptives, because I would agree that if a woman goes off of the pill and then her period just doesn't come back, the pill didn't cause that, but the pill certainly didn't help it. And potentially if she had not been on the pill, she would have noticed quite a bit because again it's quite obvious if you're only having four periods a year so then that prevented her from being concerned about it sooner 
And actually, right, exactly. Yes. And I just in line with this, in my private Facebook group, I have a private Facebook group for the for the listeners. And one of the women actually commented yesterday in there. And so by the time you're listening to this episode, it wasn't yesterday. (laughs) But at the time recording, it was yesterday. But she said that her doctor told her that it was good that she was on the pill because it's healthy to have regular periods. And of course, that just boiled my insides because I'm like, well, you weren't <laughs> having regular periods because there's. Yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah. I find, yeah, um, maybe you could speak to the that aspect of it around that misinformation and then how problematic it can be for women who do have irregular cycles and to be put on the pill as treatment. Well, yeah, so you're, you're right that being on the pill for maybe, you know, 15, 20 years may have masked an underlying condition and then it blinded you to the fact that something was wrong in your body that you, so you didn't become more proactive about fixing the problem. So that I think is potential downside for sure to be being on the pill. The other is there is, I mean, I, I'm not sort of pro, I definitely not pro um, and nor anti birth control pill. I do think in some women who don't ovulate regularly and therefore they can't make progesterone, they that gives them a little bit of progesterone that they're not capable of making on their own. And having that progesterone is beneficial for them. Now, I think ideally those women ought to correct the reason why they're not ovulating regularly and and therefore ovulate regularly and produce progesterone on their own. But there's some people that just are, are not interested in making the effort to do that. So they don't want to stop eating pizza and donuts and they don't want to exercise. Uh, and so for those people, if their periods are you know, they're only ovulating four times a year, uh, they're actually better to get that little bit of progesterone coming in every month, which they ought to be having. So, I mean, I do think ideal in a perfect world, people should be proactive and fix their own health when there's an obvious problem. But not everybody wants to do that. And the pill is an easier solution than having to take out the pizza and the donut. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I do think that that's the thing to do, <laughs> to get the pizza and the donut. But yeah. uh, it, there is a, there is merit to having a certain amount of progesterone every month. Ideally, you produce it yourself. But there are some people that are only going to be able to make it four times a year because that's the only time that they're ovulating and you have to have progesterone. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's important to point out that the, the progestins on the pill are not the same as what's in your body. So although right. they look sort of similar in terms of molecular structure, but they're not the same. They're doing other things that your own yes. progesterone wouldn't be doing. So they they have right. all these other effects on your body. So yeah. absolutely, it's better to be able to address that problem. So when you have a woman who comes to you, and then she's only ovulating a few times a year, how are you able to support her and to really tighten up those cycles so that she's having a regular ovulation and then consequently actually producing that progesterone, you know, when, how often that she should be? Right. Well, and that's where it's a lot of detective work to try to figure out what is the reason why. So the 60% of the time it's too much DHEA, which is a weak male hormone, or too much testosterone. So that's the high androgen portion. Those ones are ones where it's all to do with their blood sugar and their insulin. So that's where cutting out the pizza and the donuts and exercising will fix it. The other 40% is something else. And that's where that requires more detective work to figure out what that other 40% is. So is it too much prolactin, in which case Vitex can help or B and B6 can help? Is it not enough estrogen, in which case sometimes we need to support other glands that support the ovaries, like the adrenal glands and the thyroid, so that they're working properly so that the ovaries are producing enough estrogen. Sometimes it's underactive thyroid. Sometimes it's too much stress. Sometimes it's uh, low body weight. Uh, So it's a number of kind of troubleshooting you have to do with that other 40% to try to figure out why they're not ovulating regularly and fix those factors. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's so important to really uh, take in what you said, because this is an investigative process where there's not one Mm -hmm. answer for everybody, regardless of how excellent your information is about one thing. There's just so many things that could be going on with you specifically. And uh, it just can't be understated how important it is to get support in that process, again, from someone who does specialize in that particular area. And um yeah, like I'm starting to, I just use analogies all the time. And it's like, well, would you take your car to Dunkin Donuts for an oil change? <laughs> no, yeah. you wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. So if you have PCOS, you need to take your ovaries to somebody who really 
uh, has an in-depth knowledge and appreciation of what's happening and knows what to look for, knows what to test you for, and knows how to approach the situation in alignment with what it is that you want. And I think we all know intuitively, some of us do, you know, just at the, we're at the point in our lives, we just don't have the time to go and do a complete diet overhaul. So you, you're looking for more of a specialized kind of medical approach. Whereas some others, you know, other women know that for me, all of those drugs are not what I want right now. I would like to take more of a natural approach. So then the second aspect of that is you have to find somebody who not only specializes in that area, but also is coming from a complementary perspective that, that as you are. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And so along with PCOS, one of the, the questions that I get quite a bit, especially because I work with a lot of women who are, you know, recently come off of hormonal contraceptives, and their acne comes back, you know, the pimples mm-hmm. just start sprouting out of their face. And yeah. um, that is one of the biggest reasons why women would be, you know, inclined to go back on it because, you know, yeah. you're 35 and here you are having acne like a teenager, like it's just not, yeah. <laughs> not going to work out. So yeah. how do you support women who are experiencing that aspect of it? Yeah. So a lot of times what I will see is the person who did that, they came off the pill and their acne got bad and they went back on because they were just freaked out about the acne. And so then they'll come to me before trying to come off it again, uh, which I think is probably the best approach because I usually would say, you know, what we're what we're going to do to prevent the acne from coming back, it might take a few months. So you might be wanting to stay on the pill for a few months and that you're not getting the big flare up when you do come off of it so that we can fix the underlying problem before you do try coming off it again. Mm-hmm. Um, but that kind of thing is, is again, trying to figure out what, why that person has acne. That, that deep, painful cystic acne along the jawline is usually related to too much of the nail hormones, either DHA or testosterone. So that's, again, diet stress reduction exercise, try to get insulin levels down, things like chromium, vanadium, uh, bitter melon, cinnamon, zinc. Uh, these can also help to get insulin levels down. So those are the kind of things I might do to try to improve insulin, reduce testosterone, so that then once they do try to come off the pill, it's not a big major flare-up. Mm-hmm. But the other thing I find really helpful with acne is that is to improve liver detoxification because it's a, it's a complex process. Um, taking a lot of times what you might read online, like dandelion and milk thistle, really doesn't do very much. But what you want to do with supporting liver detoxification is give the liver the specific ingredients it has to have to be able to take a hormone or a toxin and fully break it down into something your body recognizes as waste. And so what it needs for that is something called indole-3-carbonyl, which is found in broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and Brussels sprouts. It has to have B6, B12 and folic acid and folic acid in the right form of folic acid, which is not what's in most supplements. Uh, it's got to have magnesium and it's got to have something called glucurate, which is also found in broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. So uh, supplying those nutrients and often more so than what the person could consume from their diet um, helps to move along through the liver so that it's able to metabolize hormones properly and get clear out any excess. Uh, and if it's not clearing them out, then they're accumulating and that's where people are getting problems. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that it's so I really love how you broke that down and really gets at the idea that the acne is a symptom of an underlying issue. And it can be an issue with hormonal imbalance, it can be an issue with inadequate hormonal clearing, where your your liver isn't able to really break these down and get them out the way that, that, that yeah. it should be yeah. happening. And, and so I think it's really important just overall, one of the messages that I would like for this, you know, my podcast to to spread <laughs> overall is more that it's not, there's not just um, this one simple thing for everything. You know, what you right. see as a symptom can be related to a number of different factors. And it doesn't mean that that in and of itself doesn't mean that it's this impossible thing to solve. But it does right. mean that you have to take more of a a strategic and um, kind of whole holistic approach as opposed to thinking that it's like one supplement for one symptom, like, oh, I have acne, I'm going to take this. Right. Well, you know, Dr. Frank, we're coming towards the end of our time together. It has really been a pleasure talking to you and we've covered so much ground. We've talked about so many different topics today. From everything that we've talked about, one of the, I have a couple questions to end with, so about two more questions. And one of the questions I was thinking about when I was preparing for our interview is, you know, if you could send like a public service announcement 
to women, young women. So kind of, or even going back to your 20 year old self, I mean, you were a naturopath, so maybe you knew all of this stuff at that time. But if you could send a message out to women who are kind of coming of age uh, about their fertility and everything based on what we've talked about, what would you want them to know? You know what, I think if I was choosing one factor to try to kind of be on top of with fertility or hormone balance generally, it really does have to do with blood sugar. And so I would really, to my former self, say, you know, at the time you could get away with eating those things, but getting away with eating them as far as not getting fat from eating them doesn't mean that they were good for your body. So we should probably have not have been having a Danish for breakfast or having a muffin for breakfast. Like those things, I, those are the things that I wish I'd known back then that I should not have been eating and what I could have eaten instead of eating those things. Mm -hmm. It's incredible the profound impact that diet has. I think it's, we, you know, it's being talked about more and more, but we still underestimate how important that is. And what is the one thing? So if it's not, if it's that or something else, but what is the one thing that you would like the listeners to take away from our conversation today? I think it's if you suspect there's anything going on with you, whether it's a reproductive thing or a hormonal thing, if you are you know, in the conventional medicine and you want to stay that way, still try to push for being properly investigated for what the problem is. I do find, and, and I've seen it lots of times with patients, is that there seems like a bit of a brush off that sometimes happens. And I don't think you deserve to be brushed off. I think if you've got something going on with you that you feel is not normal, um, and you're thinking ahead to future fertility, especially, that's smart of you to be doing. And if you're being, being kind of brushed off, not thoroughly investigated for measuring all of your hormones and looking to see whether in the context of you and where you're at in your menstrual cycle, is this that to the ideal level for this hormone, um, then, then you're being done a disservice. So I do think it's important to be your own advocate to some extent. Um, or if not, then see somebody that can be your advocate or somebody who can tell you what, what needs to be done and how to address it and how to fix what's out of balance and not just not just take this pill and not just have this surgery or not just do this IVF. There are always other options. Yes, I think those are amazing words to end on. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frank, for taking the time to come on the show and share your wisdom and your knowledge. It was a great uh, conversation and it was really my pleasure to be able to chat with you. Where can our listeners go to find out more information about you and, and uh, what you do? And also if, you know, for the listeners who are local, because I know some of you are actually listening from whether it's the, the GTA in Toronto or the surrounding areas or even just in Ontario in general. Uh, so my clinic is called Forces of Nature Wellness Clinic. We're at Young and Eglinton in Toronto. Our website is forcesofnature.ca. So that's a great place and, and not too difficult to remember. And then my personal website is called naturopathtoronto.ca. That is a great, um, you got a really good domain. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. It was so much fun. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, I would love it if you would share it with a friend who you think could benefit from it. You can find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 142. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Frank. It was such a pleasure to be able to chat with her and really get her perspective on a number of different topics from endometriosis to PCOS and unexplained infertility and to really get a sense of her detailed protocol when it comes to not only treating and supporting her patients to improve their health and their fertility, but also to the detailed diagnostic protocol and approach that she takes. And I really appreciate her perspective because she really shares that this process of improving health and fertility is complex. It's not simple and straightforward. And although it can be simple in a way for a trained practitioner who specializes in that area, and by simple, I just mean that they know what some of the key factors are that impact these areas. They know what to look for. They know what tests to request. And they also know what type of procedures and protocols and treatment plans, supplemental plans to incorporate when certain things are identified. So I can't stress enough two things. One, that it's so important when you have a specific type of challenge to find a practitioner who does specialize in that area. And so whether that is a naturopath who specializes in fertility or endometriosis in particular, having someone with a lot of history, background and experience and also, I feel like another piece of that is that they love that topic. So when someone specializes in a certain area, 
like in Dr. Frank's case, she shared that she personally experienced PCOS and that was what inspired her to really focus on that area as well as fertility in general. And so I feel that it is really important if you're able to, to find somebody who does specialize in those areas, who loves to work in those areas, because then you're really getting somebody who's invested in that particular area and really invested in supporting you in a specialized way. And the second piece of that, I feel that it's also important not to expect that one practitioner is going to have all of the answers for you. And I think that that's how we're trained. If we think about the traditional allopathic system, you have a doctor, your doctor knows everything, kind of like a father figure. <laughs> and so then you go to your doctor and you, you know, you have the, the questions, your doctor has the answers, and then you go home and, and you know, you're fixed. I think it's quite obvious that that approach and perspective is flawed because there's no one practitioner that does have all the answers for every single possible challenge you could be having. Even just think about specializations and there's different practitioners that specialize in different fields. So the idea of setting up your healthcare team and recognizing who you would like to be on it, recognizing that you're, you know, you're going to need a doctor, medical doctor, you're going to need a functional practitioner, potentially you may need to look into acupuncture. You may need to have somebody like myself who specializes in fertility awareness and reproductive health from that perspective of charting and using the menstrual cycle chart as a tool to really identify and hone in on what could be happening in your menstrual cycle or whether it's someone like a health coach who can support you into making the decisions, the changes that you need to make in order to improve your health. I feel that it's really important to go into this with that perspective. And in addition to that, if you do go to somebody and you find that your perspectives are not aligned, then I think that it's also important to recognize that sometimes, even if the person is super sweet, super nice, then if they're not a fit or if they don't specialize in that area or you don't feel that your perspectives are aligned, that there's nothing wrong with actually seeking out a different practitioner in that field. And so I think when you think about all those things and take all those things into consideration, you really get more of a realistic view and and set your expectations more realistically as to what to expect from your practitioner. It's not reasonable to expect that one practitioner is going to have all of the answers. And so, you know, no one cares more about your health and your fertility than you do. And so this is part of that empowerment piece of really taking it into your hands and figuring out what's going to work best for you. So I just want to thank you again for listening to the show. I want to give a special shout out uh, once again to our show sponsor, Cora Tampons. So if you haven't checked them out, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash Cora. And for those of you who are looking for support in the area of charting and really getting the fertility awareness piece under control, getting a sense of what's happening in your charts and having that additional understanding of you know, why you're seeing what you're seeing, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me and book your free 15 minute consultation with me from there if you have questions about the programs. So I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to listen to the show. There's so many podcasts you could be listening to, but you're listening to mine and I really appreciate that. Uh, it's because of all of you that I keep podcasting all of you uh, who've been listening and supporting the show for such a long time. And if you are interested in delving into these topics a little bit deeper or having conversations like these with like-minded women, I would like to invite you to jump into the Fertility Friday Facebook community. So you can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community to be redirected to the Facebook group. So thanks again. And as always, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.